all for coming. Um, my name is Matt Knight. I'm curator of prehistory at National Museum of Scotland, and I'm one of the co-organisers for this session, along with Helen Chittock, uh, Museum of London Archaeology, and she'll introduce herself shortly. Um, we're really excited to have uh, a great lineup of speakers today, both um, in person and virtually, um, and we're looking forward to lots of discussion with you all um, about fragmentation, fragments, and all of its manifestations. Great. Um, but before we move on to fragments, uh, I want to start by talking about a complete object, uh, this absolutely beautiful garment, uh, the so-called Orkney hood, recovered from a peat bog in 1867. I need to wear the microphone. There we go. That might be better. Um, so it's a woven garment um, produced from Shetland fleece wool, um, and contrary to the very stern looking face that you see wearing the hood, uh, experimental archaeology has shown rather than a heavy browed adult male, it probably fit a nine year old girl. Um, uh, and it dates to the early medieval period around 200 to 600 AD. Um, and it appears to our eyes complete. And yet, a closer study of this garment by um, Jackie Wood, an experienced weaver and craftsperson, uh, she revealed some really fascinating insights into its construction. So firstly, the individual yarns that make up the weave were probably produced by four different spinners, um, putting uh, the different materials together. And secondly, and more intriguingly, Jackie's research identified that the hood was actually the result of recycling. Two pieces of woven textiles from previous garments were recycled and reused with additions to transform previously fragmented pieces of clothing into a new piece for a child. And we open our session with this object because we feel it immediately challenges, uh, and ch challenges us to think about the very integral role that fragmentation plays in the archaeological record. Even when we're dealing with seemingly complete objects, fragmentation of other materials played a part. In this case, we might even consider the fragmentation of the sheep that produced the wool, um, although the sheep hopefully went on to continue living after, after being fragmented. And further, it emphasises that the fragments of things can come together to make something new and create new relations. Um, a garment for a child is a particularly evocative idea being created out of the process of fragmentation and the recycling of uh, older materials is incredibly relevant in the Anthropocene era for uh, with recycling playing such a large part of our lives today as it did in the past. So ultimately, fragmentation was not the end. It was transformative and meaningful. And these are points that we hope we'll come back to repeatedly throughout this session. Historically, though, fragments have been treated a little bit unfairly. They're often considered pieces of scrap or they're bits of waste or uh, they're ignored altogether and yet they are one of the greatest elements of the archaeological record. They are the things we find most regularly. We so rarely find complete objects, although they've been given most of the attention. And the fundamental shift in our appreciation of fragments and fragmentation, certainly in prehistoric European archaeology, came with the advent of John Chapman's fragmentation in archaeology in the year 2000, and followed by various subsequent works, including his joint book with Pizzerth Gardaska uh, called Parts and Holes. And their studies in, of the prehistory of southeastern Europe revealed the important role that fragments of different objects and materials played in social practices and the creation of identities. A central tenant uh, that uh, provides foundation to their arguments is this idea of chain enchainment, which refers to the varied ways uh, people created and maintained social relations with others through material means. And this included not only uh, complete objects, but also fragments. Evidence for the role of fragments was identified through specific treatments of fragments in different contexts, such as graves and settlements, as well as refitting fragments across uh, geographically widely spanning contexts. So fragments of the same object, sometimes found uh, several kilometers apart. And these objects may be explained, uh, exchanged, deliberately broken, reworked, and the resulting pieces serve to stand in for not only the complete objects, but also the people and the relationships they represent. They were an integral part of the multiple nature of personhood and the multiple nature of objects. 
So much work has been dedicated to studying and understanding the social importance of complete objects, but fragments far less so. And the concept of uh, enchainment and its role in establishing and maintaining social relations has been a great source of inspiration since 2000, um, including in mine and Helen's respective work. And today's session was actually conceptualised uh, over two years ago, back in 2020, when we'd intended to do a reflection on the, this work uh, 20 years on from fragmentation in archaeology, though the impact of COVID and everything else means we're doing it 22 years on, which doesn't have quite such a nice ring. Uh, uh, we, at, um, and to add to this, we invited John and Zerka to be discussants within this, section, uh, this session today, which they kindly agreed to three years in a row, and now strike action means they can't attend. Um, so instead, uh, they have uh, pre-recorded virtual presentations uh, reflecting on some of these ideas and topics, and we'll play those as a stimulant for discussions. And we should also acknowledge the work of the speakers who have provided their presentations and notes in advance for John and Berserka to contribute um, and reflect on. So fragmentation has touched quite a wide range of themes. Uh, fragmentation in archaeology has touched a wide range of themes related to fragmentation, but it is clear from recent years that this is a field that continues to be developed and enhanced with much more to be explored. Fragmentation of objects, buildings, monuments, people, animals, and even landscapes are attracting more and more academic attention, uh, interest and revealing fascinating insights into how people utilize not only the resulting fragments, but also the process of fragmentation to create their sense of selves, their varied relationships and the wider social world. Robert Johnston has put it uh, quite eloquently in his recent book on Bronze Age fragmentation, a world of fragments is a world of relations. And as we now recognize, buildings were deliberately dismantled and burnt down, graves throughout prehistory and into later periods were not strictly closed contexts, burials were reopened, pieces of objects and people were taken away and added to. Cremations, for instance, often appear to be only tokens of the original deposit, and composite objects lack crucial pieces, sherds of pottery, fractured stones, they're all deliberately arranged and placed in pits, and objects and people could and were fragmented. And perhaps the most striking example of this from Britain is the late Bronze Age mummies from Clad Hallen on South Uritz. And these burials included one person made up of three different individuals put together over several centuries. And it's a, quite a striking expression of the idea that personhood in the past was not necessarily singular, but in fact maybe a composite idea. People in the past were the sum of their parts and sometimes the parts of others. In my own work, uh, focusing predominantly on Bronze Age Britain, I've sought to better understand processes of fragmentation relating to Bronze Age metalwork as, as well as other material culture. How and where did fragments end up? Are there patterns in the data? Where are the missing parts? and so on. One key area that's always intrigued me is not necessarily why were things broken, but how were they broken? What were the performative elements that went into creating fragments? And this, I believe, is fundamental to understanding the importance of fragmentation as a process, um, and by extension, what the importance of those fragments might have been. Bronze Age metalwork, for instance, required heating and striking to break it up. This is a process that required skill, material knowledge, access to tools, and I feel it completely reshapes when uh, how we think about the pieces of bronze and other fragments of objects that crop up in the archaeological record through metal detecting, um, often in, in very stray areas, areas without context. But by thinking about the process of fragmentation, it adds to the biography beyond a piece of scrap, a piece of scrap, and places them back into a process, back into an assemblage and part of the social world. The same is true of pottery that required smashing in performative ways and fracturing of uh, quern stones, cobble tools, all of which are quite difficult tasks but clearly were intentional. Um, so patterns in the treatment of these contexts of these stray finds um, and even those well contextualized finds that come from settlements and graves start to elucidate aspects of meaning, especially when we set them in the context of every, every other part of the assemblage that's going on at this time. Um, and it's at this point that I will hand over to Helen. Thank you very much. Oh, shall I put these oh. the mic yes. on? Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thanks everyone for coming along to our session. Um, I'm the other session co-organiser. Um, my name's Helen Chitok, and I'm a post-ex project manager for MOLA. Um, so coming from a, a different kind of piece from Matt, but 
and share a lot of ideas. Um, so Matt has just mentioned uh, context, and I think um, this is, is often key to recognising the purposeful nature of fragments. It can sometimes be difficult or impossible to tell whether fragments have been deliberately or accidentally generated. But looking at the specific combination and placement of fragments within certain types of archaeological deposit can demonstrate uh, their usefulness, whether deliberately or accidentally created. This statement refers to contexts um, in the archaeological sense, but as Matt has said, uh, consideration of broader types of contexts, such as the context of process um, and an event, is also fruitful. And of course, the context of fragments as parts of new objects, like the Orkney hood, which we saw just a few minutes ago. All of these types of contexts can be viewed as forms of assemblage. In the 2017 paper, it just plays, do we need to turn? In the 2017 paper, Archaeology and Assemblage, Yanis Hamalakis and Andy Jones write that Chapman and Gaidaska's work on fragmentation was among the first to realise the significance of assemblage in archaeology. Assemblages, they suggest, can also be viewed as accumulations, um, accumulation being a central concept in Chapman's, uh, Chapman's book. Arguably, the concepts and language that have developed through the use of assemblage theory in archaeology are also useful for work on fragmentation, providing ways of articulating the ways that the relations between fragments change over time as they move from being a whole um, to being parts of that whole. Work on the variable spatial relationships present in different assemblages allows us to look at the dispersed fragments of broken objects as belonging to multiple assemblages, re retaining connections to their former configurations, whilst also belonging to new assemblages of fragments. Harrison Robb's work on assemblage and scale is particularly helpful in visualising nested scales of assemblage in time and space, from the atomic scale right up to the astronomical scale. Ultimately, assemblages are more than the sum of their parts, as both the relations between their parts and the relations they retain with other assemblages come into play. And I'll just very quickly, because I don't want to run out of time, mention the, the fragment of pot in the hand there. Um, that's my husband's hand, because I had to text him yesterday and say, uh, could you go and look for the piece of plant pot that's in the spare room and take a picture of it and send it to me? Because I wanted to include it in this presentation. Um, it's a piece of a pot that was smashed by John Chapman um, at a really excellent um, symposium on fragmentation, um, which was held at Stockholm University last year. Um, Matt and I weren't able to go due to COVID travel restrictions, but um, having performatively smashed that pot and handed out the fragments to the delegates, John posted uh, a shirt each to me and Matt, so we've got these at home now. I'm sure you've got yours as well somewhere. <laughs> yeah, proudly displayed. Yep. <laughs> Okay, uh, so in 2010, 10 years after the publication of Fragmentation Archaeology, Marcus Britton and Oliver Harris published this really useful paper, which examined the ways in which Chapman's work has been taken up and used across many different archaeological subdisciplines. fragmentation being a relevant theme in a wide range of different um, studies. This is what we mean by the fragmentation revolution, I guess, um, the recognition of fragments and fragmentation as important subjects for study across archaeology. Britton and Harris examine the relationships between fragmentation, enchainment, relational identities, and individual personhoods to emphasize the fact that these things don't uh, necessarily all go hand in hand. And they warn against um, applying um, this package of concepts um, uncritically, arguing for the careful consideration of um, individual cultural contexts uh, when discussing fragmentation. Um, so I guess one, um, one question for this session is whether we've managed to take on these recommendations, whether we've followed them, um, and how we've all been using the concept of fragmentation and those other concepts um, in our own work. And um, maybe we'll come back to it later. Whilst, as Britton and Harris show, fragmentation has become an important theme um, across archaeology, it's arguably retained um, particular significance, I think, in prehistoric uh, studies. Thank you, Matt. Um, that might be my own bias speaking. However, I think there's potentially lots to be gained from seeking parallels um, and comparisons in the contemporary world. And so I'm going to briefly, very briefly, <laughs> take two examples um, the use of a concept of fragmentation in contemporary art that I think resonate with um, 
the issues of accumulation, theatre and value that we often encounter in archaeological fragmentation. So first of all, um, Cornelia Parker, um, Cold Dark Matter. Um, I think Parker's work is interesting to archaeologists in loads of ways, um, but of particular relevance to this session is her most famous work, Cold Dark Matter, an Exploded View. This artwork is the exploded fabric and contents of a garden shed blown up by the British Army at Parker's request, <laughs> and <laughs> including everything from tools to toys, some with personal significance to Parker and others uh, sort of accumulated from other sources. The surviving pieces have been used to create an installation, each suspended from the ceiling um, as if depicted mid-explosion and lit by a single light bulb, creating dramatic shadows on the walls of wherever it's displayed. The meanings behind this work are uh, multiple and complex. The shed is a place where the things that you don't want to throw away accumulate. Um, an explosion is an iconic event, recognisable to all and appearing in multiple different forms of, of media. Parker's work captures the split-second nature of an explosion, but also the enduring aftermath. So for this session, I think this work captures the theatre of fragmentation as an event, as well as the question of what happens to the resulting pieces. Uh, can, I ju can I just do Banksy? OK, no, we'll come back to Banksy later. Um, so the last bit um, that I wanted to talk about very quickly was just to put the session timings up. Um, as Matt mentioned earlier, um, some of our speakers sadly haven't been able to make it due to travel issues and various other things. And we're going to be, um, for those people, playing videos of their talks, which they very kindly sent in to us. Um, so without further ado, um, I will introduce our first speaker, um, who, who is not with us physically, but um, we're going to be watching a talk now. Um, uh, we'll be watching a talk by Sarah Bockmeyer from the University of Kiel. Um, as, um, and she's, she's going to be telling us about tempering in fragmentation studies um, in the context of an assemblage of funnel beaker pottery. So I will put her presentation on. Thank you.